Well, you know, oh, baby, you know. Oh, oh. The one that Jack, uh, oh, baby. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know what they say? Mike Love, not war. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Comedy Centric, your place for all things comedy. Every week, we'll discuss the legends and the people who built the business. The performers, writers, behind the scenes, and stories that you have never heard. So relax, take a load off, and join us for this episode of Comedy Centric. Now the host of your show, nationally headlining comedian, a woman with a wicked sense of humor and a killer Jersey accent, Julia Scotty. Hey. Hi. Hey, so, We weren't sure you were going to be on this show you were having well, uh, I'm in and out, you know. <clears throat> I know I'm like and the you, wind. You are, you're like the wind. Uh, you're having you're having problems with, uh, with the, the internets, <clears throat> all of them. Yeah, so if we lose you, we're going to pretend that you weren't even here. That's very easy to do. No, uh, but but um, what did I have to ask you a question? You wanted to, do you want to ask me something? No. No. Oh, well, we were talking about Twitter. Yeah. And uh, about and it? I well, and I I'm thinking about dumping Twitter. Like I did I'm it already. About, I know, I can't believe it. You had a lot of followers. I gave up about 5,000 followers, which really wasn't a lot in, you know, but it is enough. It's a lot for me. Yeah. Most of so them where, came from Where are you uh, now? Where, where I'm right now I'm on I'm on uh uh, I'm on uh, Facebook. I'm on Instagram, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I should be on antibiotics because my <laughs> my should, throat's got a little decongestant or something. Um, yeah, you know, I'm it's, I'm torn because I used to like getting the news, but I, you know, I whenever I'm in a dilemma that's technologically uh, oriented, I say to myself, "What did I do dilemma before e? this stuff?" <laughs> No, but right. I'm like, what did I do before Twitter? Yeah. How did I get my information? And you, I you and get I the newspaper from Bobby. Oh, you got you know, Scotty. A rotten kitty keeps here. Me, I keep missing my door. But no, it's seriously. I mean, I'll you know, if I need the news, I'll find the news. If I I just but that's not news what's on there now. It's all this crazy. I know. The the maniacs well, have he, taken it over. I know. So I don't need that. You know, I, who, no, no, who needs that? No, hmm. but anyway, um, well, some people still, you know, but uh, what else is going on? How's your toilet paper and your uh, your bamboo toilet paper? Uh, very I good, follow up, I'm very, there. very happy. And I'm the garbage getting, can, bags, did the, the bags, bags are wonderful, the bags are wonderful. Bags, are uh, wonderful. I'm getting more, more wipes to the roll, um, uh, and the bags are okay. That's know, older, that's probably toilet a little. Paper. TMI. All right. Well, you asked me. You opened it up. Well, I didn't ask for an in-depth accounting of how many sheets you're going through every time you sheet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I I am um, I am super excited about tonight's show. I, are you? Are you? Yes. I hope you make it through this whole show. Um, <laughs> me too. I feel like I have a yeah. terminal illness. I hope no, she, no, I hope no, she no, makes no. it. No, but this guy, oh, he's been every voice on the planet. For cartoons, uh, and not, not just cartoons. Did you know he was the B for the Honey Nut Cheerios too? I, I and the Red M and M. The Red M and M. I I didn't know that until yeah. Oh, so uh, yes, I know. Very Billy excited. West is going to be with us tonight. Billy West. Billy West, and he's and uh, he was on the Howard Stern show. That's right, and he'll I think he'll talk about that too. So well, I'm gonna. I don't want to take a time away from. Take a time? What am I, Italian or something? I think you are. Uh... Hey, I don't want to take a time away from the Billy West. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, so we're going to go away, take a quick break, and come back after the music. So You're going to put uh, a hat on because my hair is... All like, right. I need well, a haircut. You can put a hat on, and we'll see you right on the other side of the break. Okay? Mwah. Bye. Bye. Hi there, everybody. It's me, Julia. Hey, why am I talking to you now? Now, of all times? Uh, because I just, uh, they, my, my new special on Dry Bar, uh, Dry Bar Comedy Channel, has just been released. It's called Julia Scotty Jersey Fresh, because that's what I am. I slap myself. That's how fresh I am. 
So uh, you have to subscribe, though, to get the dry bar. Um, and if you do, you get access to, like, I don't know, thousands of other comics. But see my special first, Jersey Fresh. And if you enter my name, Julia Scotty, uh, it's my understanding that you will get a free month of dry bar. So um, go. What are you waiting for? Jimmy, I am so excited. We've been waiting for this guy for, for close to a month now. I, I don't even have to tell you all the voices he's done because I'm amazed when I tell people that Billy West is going to be on. Everybody freaked out, including you. So uh, uh, I'm I am thrilled to have have you on today, Billy. Welcome to uh, thank you. How you thank doing? You. I'm doing well, thank you. Good. Where are you? Uh, I'm in um, Los Angeles. Oh, okay. So you're home. You're not on the road or anything. No, I was on the road. Until last night, I went to a show in San Francisco. It was the uh, Fan Expo. And these Comic-Cons, I love doing them, um, you know, because I get to meet and talk to everybody out there. I can kind of know what's going on. You're a god. You're like, I mean, when I mentioned that you were going to be on this thing, they were going crazy. Like, how'd you get him? How'd you get him? I don't know. He asked them. <laughs> Yes, you're you're, yeah. you're amazingly accessible. I have to say that, and we have to thank Jackie Martling for hooking us up too. Because uh, oh, Jackie, I know he boy, I love him so much. So do I. We, I'm we gonna, had him. I'm on. gonna see him. I'm gonna see him next week. I think, or the week after that. You coming east? Yep. Oh, cool. Okay, that's great. Great, great. great. Yeah, I know, say, we, we all love. let me let me know what day you're gonna be here. <laughs> let me know what day you're gonna be here. And I'll make sure that I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, we got to use that. We got to pull that out as a clip. <laughs> See, he, uh, he, he. If you didn't know that, he and I go back to the beginning of my stand-up career. His stand-up career too. Really? He was. Yeah, he was the MC of the very first show I was on in 1980. And wow. In, in New Jersey, yeah, and. Uh, uh, he brought with him on that show. I think it was Jerry Seinfeld. He said, right. Eddie Murphy was on that show. And uh, who else was on that? I forget, but it was like all these unknowns, you know? And so, wow. the, so I've known him a long, long time, but uh, uh, he was just so, so good on the show, but let's talk about you. That's why. Okay. I, I don't even know where to begin with you because, uh, but I, I want to go, I want to go to Berkeley college of music. Cause I did not know that you were such an accomplished musician. Um, I, we'll get to the voices in a bit, but I, I want to talk music to you. For okay, a bit. I spent, uh, you know, I, I, um, when I was a teenager, I started playing guitar. Um, I had my first guitar in 1961, and um, my mom moved me and my brothers from Detroit to Boston. So one of the first things she did was get me a guitar for Christmas, and it was an old clunker, and it had big thick strings. They were like railroad track ties. And um, I somehow managed to make it do something. And then finally, when I got a good guitar, it was like, oh, my God. It was like training with rocks on your back and then yeah. you know, finally, uh, being free to, to, to move about. And um, let's see. Um, yeah, and I started playing in bands during high school. And um, I barely got out of high school. I wanted to... Um, I wanted to play music. I wanted to run away and join the circus. You know, I hated school. I, I was a drummer. I know the. I know exactly what you mean. I, I, Did I hate school? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but but, um, but I played and played, and um, I came up with these guys. In um, I'm like the Jackie Martling of music. I came up with Aerosmith and. Uh, Did you really? <laughs> well, yeah, they were like they were living in a house in Brookline, Massachusetts. You know, like all together in one house. And they had the same uh, manager as my band did. And this guy said to me, Wow. This guy, Frank Borsa, he said, You got to go see Aerosmith. He had a, a funny thing, you know, I think that the back of his tongue was too big for his mouth. And he said, Gotta see these guys, Aerosmith. You got to go see them. They're unbelievable. And I said, Okay, I'll go see them. And um, me and my friend were sitting and they were these guys were banging into each other on stage and all out of tune. And I said to my friend, these guys are never going to make it. What kind, Number one, what kind of a name is Aerosmith? <laughs> you know, well, but I got to know them. I got to know them. And I, I came up with Pete Wolf from the Jay Giles band. I knew all these guys early on. Boston was such a, a, a fertile ground. Uh, oh, yeah. 
back then. Yeah, and but, even for comedy at the beginning of comedy in the eighties, it was, it was insane to all the people that were coming down from there. Well, I, I went out and did, you know, ventured out in the eighties. Um, after I was done playing music, I wanted to look towards comedy because I was screwing around on stage anyway. And um, I said, I'm going to go try these open mic nights. And I came up with guys like uh, Lenny Clark and Steve yeah. Sweeney. And um, they were around when I first came out there. And one of the per one of the guys that was really, really kind to me was Barry Crimmins. Oh, uh, look, Barry he was such a great guy. You know, I don't know if you can see behind me, but there's a picture of Kevin Meany over my shoulder there. Oh, Kevin, um, I knew him you too. See yeah. Kevin? yeah. And Kevin and I were really close friends. And I met Barry, actually met Barry, got to know him uh, at Kevin's Wake. That's, and we stayed in touch a little bit. Uh, yeah, he was a, he was a great guy. Great it's hard guy. to believe. It's hard to believe they've gone like Gilbert. It's, it's hard. It's, in my mind, I, I can think of 20 people right now offhand that should drop dead. <laughs> but but Gilbert wasn't one of them. No, no, no. There is. I can I can add to that list. Believe me. I oh, I know. He's probably rewriting the st seven stages of grief right now. You know. <laughs> Acceptance. Well, go ahead. No, I don't know. <laughs> well, all right. So that that so you did do stand up, which I was surprised to hear because it didn't. You know, in doing research on you. Uh, it doesn't really mention that you did do stand up. No, I didn't. I didn't stay very long. Nobody told me you had to have an act. I just used to go up there and. <laughs> what did you do? The wall and, you know. Did um, you do but, the voices in the act? Yes, I did, and that that's what made people sit up and bark like Lassie. I was like, so I started <laughs> doing that. But I got into radio right after that, in Boston. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. It's so funny. Back then, you could have a, an HBO special or something similar to that or two of them and nobody still nobody would know who you were you know but so radio, radio would reached a lot of people yep. and i kind of fell into it in boston and i was working in the mornings and i was i i began writing you know writing my own bits and um and uh prehistoric equipment you know those days they had tape machines and yeah. Um, so you had to cut, I, used to, cut in a, I used to edit. Yeah, you had yeah. to have a, a grease pen, a white grease pen, and you mark the tape, mm -hmm. and then you slit it with a single edge razor blade, which doubled as um, a cocaine accessory. <laughs> <laughs> really, I, I had no way of knowing that. Though. I'm yeah, shocked. in radio, in radio, we uh, we used to use that thing all the time, and they were always missing or, you know. Boy, you guys go through a lot of razor blades. <laughs> Talk to Joey with the donut powder on his nose. That's uh... oh, I know, I know. You want to see uh, a house? You know, <laughs> the Picasso. House. <laughs> well, all right. So you you you're now at this radio station, and I and yeah. I and I really love the backstories for people that come on here. I, I, everybody knows what you do, and I really will get to that. But I, I love the the journey of getting from Boston to New York. Uh-huh. Uh, did you go to New York with the uh, the idea of the, of doing voiceover? Um I did have that idea. I kind of came I I went through addiction. I um it was something from when I was like 19 years old on and I was uh, I was a drunk and a druggy and a crazy and I was not a professional no matter how good I could be. I just never considered myself a professional. So I cleaned up a forced intervention in radio in Boston. And then when I came back, I was like, I could think clearly about, you know, having a goal and what the future should be. And I said, I'm going to, I want to move to New York because I wanted to go where the big time commercials were being made and right. where all the big people were. Um, Did you know anybody there? I, I knew one guy and he and I go back in radio we go back like 40 something years and um, you'd know who he was. He was the funniest thing in pants in Boston. And he used to work with me at the radio station. He was a writer. His name is Eddie Gordetsky. I know the name. I don't know him. Yeah. Yeah. He's like the Sheldon Leonard of now, you know, like he produced tons of shows with Chuck Lorre and, um, you know, I remember we used to sit in back of the radio station. We'd be as high as rats. And I would say, <laughs> Eddie, Eddie, imagine, imagine what it would be like 
to be the guy, you know, the one that, that by all others will be judged by, you know, judged um, we compared to. And I said, what must it be like? And then I called him up 43 years later and I go, Eddie, one of us knows. <laughs> 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 oh come on! I would think both of you know at this point. Yeah, we were we um, were we were um, we kind of knew that we were headed for the things that we loved, and we were going to be like the people we idolized. We that much we knew. So you 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 did you came to New York then, and you didn't go immediately to Stern though. What did you do when you first got? No, there? I worked in um, production at WXRK, which was okay, K Rock. All right, K Rock. Yeah, okay. And um, and there was a, you know, myopic program director um, who who just it was like brain dead. You know, 20 we play 25 songs or you win twenty five thousand dollars. He wanted me to make endless varieties of promos saying that. And I my brain felt like I got a shot of Novocaine in it. And I said, I'm a progressive person. And, and I, you know, what am I doing at a classic rock station? You know, they they um, they thought they invented classic rock. And I say, oh, yeah, you were there when Dwayne Allman played that solo on the <laughs> love. Yeah, you were there telling them uh, what slide bar to use. Well, were but, you uh, were you uh, doing when they were doing the promos? Were you doing the voices or was it just straight? Yeah, I was doing a lot of the voices and there was another who were you guy doing back then. Who, were you, who would you do? Oh, just, you know, whatever, whatever popped up. Um, it, I'm trying to think it was almost like. Uh, Oh, gosh. I'm trying to pull one out of nowhere. Well, you know. Oh, baby, you know. Oh, oh, the one bad uh, Jack, oh, baby. Man, yeah. Oh, you know what they say. Mike Love, not war. <laughs> 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 and and Mike Love, for people who don't know, was the lead yeah. singer of the Beach Boys. Beach Boys. And this is a classic <laughs> rock station. And one of the disc jackies back then, <clears throat> I was looking at the calendar, and, and they thought they were really clever. They had these, you know, um, Rocktober instead of October, the station's calendar, right? And Roll Vember instead of November. And this guy in all this jockey comes up in all serious. And I said, Dave, Rocktober. And he goes, That was ours, you know. And I said, I don't know if you know, <laughs> I, to the voice. That was ours. I don't know if you know this, but I invented Janice Jopuary, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Full grown men thinking they split the atom. <clears throat> that, that was ours, you know. This jockeys I found always bordered on. They 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 sort of they sort of it's like the, the what's that planet that's no longer a planet, Pluto. It's like it's they're, they're not really they're not really planets. They sort of circle though. They have an orbit way way out in space at, in the in the orbit of comets. And we yeah, it's, and we don't know if they're circular or lopsided or they they kind of they vacillate. They think they're you know, the center of the universe. They just. I know what you uh, think. You know what I, I used to think? I don't have any holy reference for these classic rock disc jockeys, even though they were supposed to be legends and that. I just, I was bratty. You know, I mean, I came in there and I said. As you should have been at that point. Well, I, I was. I was a young guy and had a lot of energy, but I had a lot of resent for, for like things that were normalized and standard about the industry. I, my. My motive was always to go in and rip it up, rip up everything and, and turn the place upside down. And that's why I met Stern is because he was like that. I know how innovators work. I've worked with them. Mm -hmm. And um, and the thing was to go in and thumb your nose at convention for starters. Otherwise, you can't have comedy if you don't have something going against the grain. <clears throat> and um, and I, I remember at the radio station, <clears throat> the disc jockeys... Um, yeah, I didn't have any holy reverence really for them. I, I have a nostalgic reverence, not you know, uh, for certain ones of my youth, like the you know, you're not from New York, but the WMCA good guys. No, were, I know of them though. Yeah, because I, so that for me coming up, yeah, radio really, uh, you know, I was attracted to the voices because I used to in my as a kid, I you know, we all did voices. You know, I I was telling Jimmy, I had, I had. Hand puppets. I had the Mo and Curly, and Larry was the only one missing. So yeah. <laughs> the day I heard you, I was like, I should have had him as my best friend. He could have filled you the hole. Had, you would have had your hand up my rear end working so, me. Like, no, 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 I don't think so. No, I, 
Hey, Mo, I some would... lady put her hand up my butt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm warning you. Cut it out. <laughs> I'm sorry. That is the greatest impression I've ever heard from any impressionist ever in my entire life. And I'm as old as you are. Oh, it's, man. The, it's the fucking is, great, man. <laughs> the thing is, is it's so... Um, it was such a nothing voice, but I remember growing up and I said, you know something? He's like the Keith Richard of the Stooges. I mean, even the little that he did was was like his kind of the glue that held it together. Yeah. Yeah. He was he was funny in his own right. I mean, never, you know, he, he needed the, he needed the he needed a mower or, or a curly to work on. But yeah, I mean his he would generate laugh. He always made me laugh. I thought he was great. Oh, I thought he was great too. But um I had a head full of the Three Stooges when I went to school um, in Detroit as a kid. Uh, I hated school. I used to get physically ill thinking about being in school. But before I would go to school, at 7 a.m., they'd be showing the Three Stooges. So I'd go to school with a head full of that stuff. And everybody said, you know, what do you think you're doing, those horrible men? How can you watch those horrible men? And I said, but they're funny, Mom. And um, but meanwhile, here we were learning comedic timing, comic acting and, and understanding how how humor worked, like in its in its early forms, like the um, yeah. the early part of the American century when humor was being um, uh, crystallized, like by the Marx Brothers and Laurel and Hardy and the Stooges. I mean, you can, what better school to go to? Well, they are my Laurel and Hardy to me are are, are gods. I just and I'm now reading. I'm reading a book uh, on uh, Buster Keaton, and you know we as com road comics think we have it rough. This poor guy coming up as a kid, his father, uh, they 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 made their nut and showbiz in vaudeville by his father flinging him around the stage. You know, into the scenery they had sort of handle in the back of his his outfit, so the father could grab him and literally just fling him around. Yeah, uh, well, at least it was for a purpose. My dad used to do that to me. Well, for no reason. my mother did. Yeah, my mother did that with the vacuum my dad cleaner. Had been drunk and a psycho, and yeah. um, and my mom <laughs> took three boys at thirty-two years old and split from from Detroit. And you couldn't even get divorced in those days. The church had a stranglehold on everybody. Um, but uh, you were saying, like, you know, how did the Stern thing come about? Is we were checking each other out. He knew who I was and I knew mm -hmm. who he was, of course. And and I sat in his office and I was doing exactly what I was just doing a minute ago. Um, we were talking about the Stooges and I started doing Larry and he started like he started choking like because he ate his he ate his lunch at like 10 in the morning. His potato. He, had, he was eating a big potato and it came shooting out of his nose. And he says, oh, fuck you, Billy West. Yeah, I'm going to call you tomorrow. Gary's going to call you. And that's how that hoopla started. I would, um, I would come in and I go, "Hey Howard, you know, um, they're showing all those clips, famous clips of Lucy on the nightly news. She must be like near the end or something. The grape stomping routine and the the chocolate conveyor belt bonbons." Right. And and, and then I started doing impressions of her like she was in Cedar Sinai. <laughs> Why are you people bothering me? Why don't you leave me alone? Oh, Christ. Now, did yeah, you... And, um... <laughs> and it was so goddamn dark. And I loved her probably more than most people. But, but Kay Gardello was a gossip. Oh, girl. I remember. Yes. Yeah, and so this witch starts writing about her. She said, these horrible, horrible people, you know, and that's what people used to say about the Stooges. <laughs> it, but, it, but he, Howard went nuts over that, and he said, I'm going to have Gary call you tomorrow morning. Now, did you write the uh, Lucy sketches and, like, the Larry sketches, or was it a collaboration with others? How did How did that Come to those, fruition. Those come were, over to here. Those were um, ad lib. They oh, it was really wow. very very little scripted material. Um, you know, you get an idea for something, and and you just you'd forget, like, because it's easy to forget with radio. Most people that are doing podcasts now are beginning to understand. It's not, hey, hello, world, hey, everybody. You know, it's like I'm talking to you, mm -hmm. and and. Um, that was the medium. It was like, all you got to do is tell somebody a story and, and you're off to the races. And then when you start throwing in 
um, you know, voices that are in, you know, of the people you're talking about. And, you know, we used to do all kinds of stuff like, um, oh, gosh, there was the Lucy thing that was awful, but we used to do, um, oh, cripes. I used to do. <laughs> I used to do these horrible voices, you know, like people that I grew up with in Detroit. And like, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go down to the 7-Eleven and I'm going to get me a pussy book. <laughs> and I'm going to get me a Slurpee. And now, you see, the Slurpee is cold and the pussy book is hot. And now together, they form weather. <laughs> I couldn't say that stuff on the radio. <laughs> Although no. I called I called Robin a vajunt once. A vajunt. <laughs> what a horrible thing to say. Uh, uh, I should have been beat up in an alleyway. Oh my god, what a great oh oh shit. But yeah, it was great radio. People, people can say anything they want now, and so gee whiz, we're, you know, how effective is anything? It's not, but but throw in one stupid thing like that. But you know, I don't think I don't I don't agree with you. I think you know, funny is funny. No matter you know, the, yes, people have stretched the limits and probably have overused the, the freedom that they're given. But yes, real genuinely funny people will always rise rise above. But you can but you can get canceled like on Twitter. Uh, when Rich Limbaugh died, I um I made a joke. I said, you know, a lot of people don't know he invented high def radio. He was both <laughs> high and deaf. <laughs> Fantastic joke. And so, so all of a sudden, really, this little wow. neurotic twenty-year-old, and they're known they're they're um, you know notorious for having no senses of humor or knowing anything about humor and want to make comment and and it's a BLM and um, you know save the silkworm and this that and I said oh here comes trouble. So she goes and you could you could hear you know when some people when you're reading their twit their Twitter yeah. post, you can almost hear them and the state of mind they're in. And I pictured this frantic little girl, wound tight, sitting there going, I used to like you and <laughs> and now I I don't like you. I hate you. And because you made fun of deaf people. And so some other dude chimes in, he goes, he didn't make fun of deaf people. He was making fun of this <laughs> Limbaugh who made tons, you know, but you know, as well as I do, uh, Julie, that uh, you're, when you're explaining shit, you're losing. Oh, I, I see. I have done, I just did a dry bar special. I don't know if you know this, but I'm transgender. I, I don't know if you do that. Oh yeah. Going into this. Yeah, 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 yeah. So well, what do you want? A medal or a chest of printer? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just did a dry bar special and, and it's a very middle America kind of audience, I guess. That, and they, you know, there's the trollers are out there. Uh, forget the fact that the special was funny. Yeah. That's all they can talk about though. I thought, you know, what's happened to dry bar. They're doing nah, 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 nah. and it's like, ah, fuck you. Just leave me alone. Go away. Yeah. So anyway, I don't mind a dry bar. Why don't you guys go dry hump somewhere? <laughs> I want to talk to you about, I know we're staying in the past, and eventually we're going to get to future and all that other stuff. But I want to talk about Popeye, mm -hmm. and, and you you fucking did Popeye, man. And we I, I researched it this this morning, and I didn't realize there were like three other Popeyes before. Well, actually, what there were like seven, right, Jimmy? Yeah, it was a, yeah, quite a, a few. I thought it you were the. Other, I thought you, and then maybe one other Popeye. But oh uh, no! Well, Jack Mercer was the main one. Well, well, he was, but years. there was a guy before him. Polly McIntosh, right? That guy? No, the guy that originated the voice was named uh, Billy Costello. And We uh, got that, but before him, though, this Polly McIntosh, McClintock, that's what his name is. He was that, in a band, an orchestra. Yeah, but lots, would, those, those guys were. Voice, yeah. yeah. Those guys were, but Billy Costello was a freak. If you can watch clips of him on YouTube playing with a big band in like the early, early 30s. And he would um, he would do accents and he would do female characters and then you'd hear the Popeye kind of voice, and um, and he wound up Fleischer's hired him to do Popeye, but he was kind of a he was kind of a lout, you know, he was kind of like a troublemaking drunk and stuff, so they didn't know what, what the hell to do. But in their midst, there was an in betweener, which is an animation uh, 
term. It's part of the animation process in betweening. And um, there was this guy named Jack Mercer, who was also a drummer. Jack. Right, I have him. Yeah, I have him on my list. Jack Mercer, yeah. Yeah, and so <clears throat> Jack Mercer, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, he could That's imitate right. uh, William Costello. And what he brought to it was like scat singing because well, he, was a ja he was a jazzer. And, um, you know, um, he, and that voice, when I was a kid, we all tried to do it. We all right. sucked. <clears throat> um, I saw. I've heard movie. you do it, and it's got to be a killer on your throat. Well, you know what? It's not really. If you, it's it's weird. I don't even like to think about it. I have magical thinking. I don't want to know what's possible and what isn't. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, a, a bee like is flying around, and you go, "Look at the size of that bee!" And he's got these little wings. How the hell? It must be aerodynamically impossible to do that, but but the bee doesn't know. Oh, it, yeah, yeah. That's so, a great uh, attitude. Yeah. So I just thought about it. I I prefer magical thinking because it it you're not prohibited. There's nothing forbidden. There's nothing prohibited. You'll just go for it. And one of these days, bing, you might you know uh, hit the hit the bell. But uh, the voice was a high voice and a low voice at the same time. It was like, uh, yo, olive oil, you know. Yeah. And then, then it was a low voice at the same time. Um, yo, olive oil. That's I the one. I you some flowers. <laughs> <laughs> woo, Doesn't, woo. Didn't that one, wasn't it the killer, the low one? No. Really? Not really. No. Wow. It's, uh, wow. it's just like a buzz saw. But you know what? They were singers. <clears throat> what clued me into it was I go to see this movie with a friend of mine, and it was about Tuvan singers. Uh, Tuva is above Mongolia, and there's like a cowboy know, culture. Yeah. And there's these guys that when they're singing and, and they're, they have a horse beat culture, similar to our cowboy western, country western, you know, that's what it was based on. Right. And and then they'd start singing and they'd be like, yes, you know, <laughs> and I said, what the, hell? what the hell? And then I started learning about polyphonic vocalizations and stuff like that. I can I can approximate them. But there are people then I've seen freaks on YouTube that can. I've sing. seen that there, there was this woman named Lala Hathaway. She yeah. was Donnie Hathaway's daughter and she could sing friggin chords and, and yeah, i heard that it, yeah it makes you want to run away well i want to think about that i'm about, uh, scared of this this is like demonic but it's beautiful it's amazing it, it's I know. amazing uh and uh, who's it the the, the the african south african singer pata pata what was her name with the the quick singing oh um uh, the Wahili, uh, singing. yeah, I forgot I, her name just ran out of my head oh that, miriam mccabe that's it i love miriam mccabe too and she's the clicking though you can't yeah. even hear she could that she could say any word and it's just part of the word. It's it's amazing how it's very hard to do. It is, it is. And we're talking about stuff that two and a half people in the world care okay. about. <laughs> and that's not why we brought you here, because people are gonna get pissed at me and go, <laughs> No, why didn't you talk about that? <laughs> why talk about fry? Why not? <laughs> how old were you when you kind of realized that you know, hey, I can do these voices? And and I, when I, you were I at was, that age and figured it out, were you kind of trying to impress your friends on you know in the neighborhood hey i can I was, do this and do that and whatever a little freak i was always turretting out noises and voices and um and when i would go do this stuff to my friends they just sit there and look at me like yeah you know and and i used to say how friggin good do you have to be to impress these guys <laughs> you know and i and that's what caused me to want to be a superlative I said, there's going to be no doubt about it after I walk into a room and open my mouth and flatten these people. And um, it was, uh, I wish that the older me, the nowadays me, could have gone back and told the young me, do you know why these a-holes act like that? Because you're doing magic in front of their eyes. Mm -hmm. and, you're, and, and these guys, you know, it's like you're a constant and painful reminder that they will never ever ever be able to do what you're doing right now just pulling it out of your ass <laughs> and i said geez i'd hate me too i mean if i if i was talking to my older self it's like that's why they treat you like that oh i get it yeah i'd kind of hate me too <laughs>
<laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, those are the same people who will criticize you online for something you said or did and, and just say how oh, dis- that little girl, I'm oh, disappointed in you. I got to well, show you. I got to yeah. show you something. I'm mobile. OK, we're going through the uh, the castle sanctum. here. The inner sanctum. The inner sanctum. This is my guitar room. I don't know if you can see all that. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I play. <laughs> um, so this guy, he's a he's a beautiful artist, and his name is Guy Gilchrist, and he's an official artist for Disney and Warner Brothers, and um, he he did this. Um, let me see if I can show it to you. Um, oh, St- Stadler and Wadloff. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Can you see that? I can't read it though. What does it say? You can't read it, but. You know all too well what those guys do. It's like, you know, well, that was different. Yeah, <laughs> lousy, but different. Oh, ho, ho, ho. And, and you know what that is? That is the internet. Yeah. 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 That's it. The that's tube, it. Tube. Oh, my God. That's brilliant. Yes. It's the internet. That's it. <laughs> and that's the genius of Jim Henson, too, to be able to. Find those little nuggets of society well, and then put but, them into but these the more you, the more you think about those two guys, you go, oh, they just hate everything. They're hypercritical, but they show up every, every night, night. In, the, in the ballet <laughs> roost. They go yeah. right to their seats and stay to the end. Uh-huh. And, but that's Twitter. It's like if you if if you don't want to engage or you got bad things to say and you're frustrated, why do you keep coming back? That was the again i'm referencing keaton here but they had hecklers that these kids college kids were showing this is true story it's in the book they were showing up every night and just telling the father joe keaton uh you suck you know you stink the whole axe things and finally he had enough he grabbed buster keaton and threw him over the over the orchestra pit into these guys laps and, and keaton just was able to control the fall took all three of them out <laughs> oh that's great it's it's just brilliant. So uh, great. Let's so you get to all right. So you get to to the point where uh, you you creating Ren and Stempy at this point. I didn't create it. I just um, came up with the voices for it. But um, during the time I was on the Stern Show, <clears throat> um, there was um, Nickelodeon was doing some new cartoons. They were going to be called Nicktoons, mm-hmm. and um, this was in nineteen ninety one. And there was one called um, Doug, which was a very sweet, um, you know, kind of like a tweener. Like the kids loved him, by the way. Oh, di- oh, yeah. I've been yeah. finding out because there's a lot of old kids now showing yeah. up at these shows going, that was my life. You should have seen there was this big biker shows up. He's got a handlebar mustache. He's got a chain on his wallet and he's wearing the leather jacket. And, the, and, and he goes... Doug was my whole life, man. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. I said, you look like he grew up okay to me. Now you're but saying I, he, I, he he had a little bit of Larry Fine in him, right? When I've heard you in interviews say that uh, Doug was, or was no, you when that, you were. No, Stimpy was the one. Oh, that Stimpy was, was okay. On Larry Fine. But Doug was just like, I tried to, I tried to remember what it was like to be, um, just a kid that had nothing but fantasies going on in his head. And I tried to sound as pure and innocent and it didn't, it didn't quite sound like a kid, but I just wanted it to ring true. So it was like, um, dear Juno, hi, it's me, Doug, you know, and just pure. Um, and it and was. Then, now they're 27, 28 years older. So you never know how they're going to turn out, like the good kid and the bad kid. You think you know exactly how it's going to go, and you don't, because it's like, Dear Journal, hi, it's me, Doug. Today, I blew up a courthouse. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> then the judge grew up, the, the judge, it was the bad kid that grew up to be the judge. Order in the court! Order! Order! Ooh, look who it is in my courtroom. <laughs> funny, you loser! Oh. I knew I was going to see you in here one day. Oh, funny, you're going to jail. 500, no, a thousand years in jail, funny. <laughs> you got trouble written all over your face. It's even spelled wrong. Oh, my God. I'm that, screaming that, and yelling. That would have been a great series like that. Huh? That would have been a great series. <laughs> Oh, I, I'm praying that somebody takes me up on it because I've done that bit 
in front of people and and everybody's got a cell phone now and i'm praying that some somebody grabs the clip and animates it <laughs> dark doug you well, know, but, but that but that show um, was part of the Nicktoons and um, the other one was Ren and Stimpy. And um, I auditioned uh, for both characters. Um, Stimpy was based on Larry from the Three Stooges. OK, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and you couldn't have a, a witty, silly cartoon character that sounded like a depressed old Jewish guy, you know, like <laughs> mine hernia, you know. <laughs> They're not going to animate that. But yet you brought you brought uh, Georgie Jessel in and, and Futurama. Well, yeah. I mean, but those are um, homages to my gallery of heroes. Sid Caesar was my idol. My, well, you, could, you can't see him, but he's hanging up on my wall. Well, he, yeah, he's I not got hanging a, up on my wall. There you see him? Can you see him? Yes. Yeah, I mean, there he is. Yeah, Sid yeah mine too. He was uh, my, my idol. And uh, Jonathan Winters was close. Oh, uh, but but anyway, um, Ren and Stimpy, uh, the Stimpy voice, um, you know, I couldn't have him sound like just like Larry, you know. Hey, Mo, I pissed on my shoe. <laughs> you know, so, so then sorry, had to be. Wait, that just puts me away. I can't, I can't even listen to that voice without laughing. I'm sorry. It's just, <laughs> it's, no matter it's, what you read from the Bible, I would still laugh. <laughs> that would be a great bit. <laughs> Larry Fine reading from Reverend the Bible. Larry, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh my God! Why hast thou forsaken me? <laughs> Why you? Uh... <laughs> Let's tear apart the Bible. Oh shit! At least I knew more funny. of the Bible. I would. I would. You'd think I would. I was. Uh, I was uh, an altar boy. And I was too. Oh my God! Look at how I turned the... out. So you knew the mass in Latin? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so, so Larry, Larry is an altar boy with the mass in Latin would have been funny. Like, uh, I, uh, I, I don't know, sir. Queer and Shaley, scientific Shay, a norm to him. A vignette regular to him. Shut up. <laughs> altar oh, boy, shit. my ass. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, that was an altar it, boy. It, it, if I could do these voices, I would never leave the house. <laughs> oh, I would just shit. buy puppets and just have puppet time all day long. I would never grow no, up. I I um <laughs> I, I have the forum where I can go and do those things. Oh, so um so the Ren voice uh he was a quintessential asshole. He was like the Jackie Gleason kind of uh angry um oh gosh, he was he was a chihuahua, so he was a little bit south of the border, but he also had like Burl Ives in him. You know, yeah, you, you yeah. used a little little swatches of these classic characters like Burl Lives, you know. Stop or I'll shoot. I told you I'd shoot, but you wouldn't believe me. Why wouldn't you believe me? And um Cat on Would they the give roof. you would they give you a, a a breakdown of the character, what he was yes. or did they leave that up to you to create? No, I was given a breakdown of the characters and um and uh John Kay, uh Chris Felusi, who uh, who uh who created the show asked me to listen to all these different, you know, things. And then there was like Peter Laurie in there, two Peter Laurie's really that people know is the German expressionistic uh, films where he'd be like, I'd like a couple of hamburgers, please. <laughs> and to make them raw. And then there would be like, I saw that eye, that eye that kept blinking and blinking. Uh, so there was two of him, and then and then you can mix in um, Kirk Douglas, you know, like uh, we're not hitchhiking anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, uh, you're a strange man. You really are. Huh? You're a strange man, but I love you. I think I love you. <laughs> Where so, are you in New York? I'll hunt. You I'm in down. Jersey, actually. Yeah, I'm in New York. Oh, Jersey. Jersey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Heard, heard of it. <laughs> it's the armpit between uh, oh, Philadelphia stop. and New York. <laughs> I know where it is. Such snobs. I know where uh, it is. Sorry. So Ren and Steppy was a cult hit. I mean, it was. Yeah, it, it was. was uh, college kids went crazy over it yeah. first. And um, I just I just thought it was um, it was a lot of screaming and yelling for me. And it was tough on me. But I was like I said, I was a young guy and I had a lot of energy back then. But now we're doing it again. And. 
I'm screaming and yelling like I did 31 years ago. And I said, you, you better keep a, have a paramedic in the lobby, you know, because I'm so 70. They're, I don't wanna... they're rebooting it? They're rebooting yes. the series? Yes, they okay, did reboot do... it. Okay. And I've been I, doing they're it. also rebooting Futurama. Aren't they rebooting that too? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so well, you're going to be all busy. <laughs> Philip J. Fry was like, you know, greetings from the year 3000. It still sucks. <laughs> and, um, I don't want to live on this planet anymore. And you need an autograph? Why not Zoidberg? Why not? And um, Zap Brannigan, the space captain, was... Um, was that supposed get... to be Phil Hartman? N no, um, not really. It's just that he was going to be slated to play that role. And he was dispatched by his wife, unfortunately. Yeah. And um, But I knew him. We We talked about these big dumb announcers that we loved. And... It was sort of like I wanted it to be a tribute to Phil because they wanted him to do it. But but I also had my own take on Big Dumb Announcers because that's what I grew up listening to. You know, like they were, um, oh, Johnny Bannon and the Human Cannon saying what's in you has got to come out. And that's what rock and roll is all about. Before we eat the slop, we got some friends here. Mr. Roy Alberson, 1961 on CBS <laughs> FM. And um, and they had a way of like <clears throat> overextending their words. and Yeah. I, you know, it was like, uh, well, six uh, minutes past the big hour, six o'clock. Eh? And I and I used to go, what is that? Who the fuck talks like that? <laughs> and I can well, do it. I can do it. But I said, it sounds so fake and phone and ingenuous. And so uh, that was one of my problems. I mean, I loved them when I was little. I used to hear people like Alex Dreyer and um, Paul Harvey. You oh, know, I, I love Paul Harvey. I to this day, I will. If I'm explaining to some something to someone, I go, and and that's what, what he's, that's the name, that's the end of whatever the oh, whole story is. That's how did he close out? And, I forget, but he used to have pauses that would draw yeah, you. Away. That would he'd, take forever. <laughs> he'd do a commercial and he'd say, "Friends, <laughs> you know what you and I need? Oh my God. Really need? That's a good cup of coffee. <laughs> that's why you need cava." <laughs> Holy shit! And his son took over too. His son took over when he died. He was doing the same. He was doing the same voice basically. But it was I know, but you're you're not gonna hear about him. I no. mean, you know, it's like it's like Noel Blank. You know, Mel Blank's son. Uh, they say the apple doesn't no, fall, yeah, doesn't fall far from the tree. No, that apple wound up in another orchard. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and I'm well, sorry. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. No, but I mean, sometimes there's like, you know, well, he's the guy's son and, uh, you know, Paul Harvey's son. I mean, he's like two orchards away from where his dad was. In well, a, right, so so don't go, don't go around point. acting like a big shot. <laughs> you now are going have been asked to do iconic voices uh, made famous by uh, Mel Blanc, you know. Yes. Uh, and and. That that is put on your shoulders. What does that feel like? Um, well, the work was already created. Everything was done. Um, your skill as a mimic is required in that regard. The thing that was daunting to me was when somebody like uh, Matt Groening comes up and says, "Look at these characters. What what would you do?" Oh, no pressure. You know, you gotta yeah. create, you gotta create. The blank piece of paper is like God's way of telling you how hard his job was. You know, great like, line. okay, so that means I got to start, I got to create dirt. And I, I guess I can build a world out of that. You know, it's, um, that's starting from nothing. And that's what I did on Futurama. And the basic, you build a backstory for these people. In, in yes. They tell you, they tell you what they're looking for and what, you know, what they love, what they hate, what the, you know, and you look at the, the physical characterization and I just went with my guts, um, uh, but but yeah, the, Mel Blanc, all the best work was done before any of us were born. That's and, true. And um, I was, <clears throat> there was a guy named Jeff Bergman who succeeded Mel Blanc. And he's a friend of mine. And he's a really, really cool guy. And he's, and he's so, he's, he's a gifted technician. He can do almost every Mel Blanc character that there was. I, I don't, I don't do that. I mean, I can do a couple, few of them, but, but I did audition for Ivan Reitman for Space Jam. And uh, and I get to work with Michael Jordan too, Doc. The closest thing to a religious figure that we have. <laughs> wow. 
that that's that's so spot on though. I mean, even Mel Blank would have to go. Yeah, I, you got the job. <laughs> um, did you get but, to meet him? Did you ever get to meet him? Yes, I did. When I lived in Boston, um, what was that like? It was. Um, I there was a local uh, underground paper called the Phoenix, and I happened to see this blurb that Mel Blank was going to be giving a voice and slideshow. He was going to show slides, and he and he had a projector, and he was going to show a cartoon too. And he said he's playing at this old. Uh, wooden hall at a college in Worcester, Massachusetts. And I said, Oh my God, I've got to go. So I get out there and I, <clears throat> I was drinking in those days <laughs> and my girlfriend took me and I was sitting there and I was just like, Oh my God, I was like transformed. Yeah. And then at the end, <clears throat> Mel says, uh, if there's anybody that wants an autograph, shit. Oh my God. Oh my God. I just got to chill. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> if there's anybody that wants an autograph, uh, make a line over here and then uh, come on. And I got up and I was body slamming little kids. And <laughs> <laughs> the board's like a hockey player. And he said, could you let the little kids go first? <laughs> you know, and, and it was like being yelled at by Mr. Oh, Spacely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, was that, that was Alan Reed though. Wasn't that him? That did no, that? no. Um, or Frank Nelson, Frank Nelson. No, Mr. Spacely was Mel Blanc. It was? Okay. Yeah, Frank Nelson was the guy that went, ooh, do I? I love Frank Nelson. Yeah, everybody loved him. We were talking, I was talking about this with, um, oh, God, somebody at the convention, the old radio programs, and, and, oh, I know who it was. It was Brian O'Halloran who was in the movie Clerks. And um, we were talking about old radio, and we were talking about um, Sheldon Leonard. Mm. And and he had that cool, you know, Sheldon Leonard, and and he was unflappable. But he played a bad guy. He was a character on the Jack Benny show, the racetrack tout. He was the. He, he was a he, lot of different things. I got a tip for you. He would always. Hey, buddy, I got a tip for you. That's right. A tip for me. Yeah. <laughs> so so he he said uh, he he was a crook, and he and he corners Benny on the on the corner of the street, and he goes. Hey, your money or your life? And there's the longest pause in radio mm -hmm. history. You hear nothing, nothing. And he goes, well, what's it going to be? And Jack Benny goes, I'm thinking. <laughs> One of the longest laughs in radio history, too. Yeah, but but see, um, nobody takes their moment now. Everything, Everybody wants everything flying at them at light speed. Um I take my moment. I deliberately, I might, it might be a pain in the ass, but for a lot of characters, I take my moment. They say, no, no, no. The clip is essential. People won't perceive it to be funny if it's not volleyball, bing bong, bing bong. Not and true. I said, no, real people don't interact like that. Mm -hmm. and, and if you have something to say, take your moment. I, I kind of learned that. At, I kind of learned that at Stella Adler. I took a um, scene study when I first moved <laughs> to New York. I wanted to be better at, performing characters so i said i'm going over to see this uh this uh stella adler and uh boy oh boy you know i mean it was an eye opener but but i but i learned some really valuable things i didn't stay long oh, so Plus, sometimes I was you just get the, what you I'm need and that's it stern, you know? so. yeah. what's that I, sometimes you get what you need from something and it's time to move on i i yeah i, I i've always been maintained that the spaces you know like in music the spaces in between the notes is what makes the music and, the, and you taking your moment is what makes great comedy sometimes. Oh yes, I always I always believed in that. Um, the the well timed pause, yeah. it's that's that's an uh, an integral part of com comic timing. <clears throat> but it's part uh, of what made Benny so so incredibly oh, popular. I mean, you oh, know, that I, character. I know, and and he just could tell such a great story. Mm -hmm. uh, and he talked about people that took their moment. Yeah. So, um, and on but, radio, that's so gutsy to have that kind of a pause. Because yes. people are formulating. They know what he's doing. Well, Stern, yeah. brought, Stern kind of brought that back, um, not single-handedly, but when he first came out, he was not concerned with getting the business of the radio station done. He was concerned with going in there and bitching about something. 
and, and just mulling it over on the air. And it yes. became addictive because he was good at it, you know? And then there was Jackie there that could fire one liners that, you know, he could integrate it into his, uh, into his, uh, monologues. But, uh, but it was great. You know, it was like, you know what I hate? I hate these stupid guys that, with the squeegees, you know, and, and build two hours out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely <laughs> right. You know, two hours. And, and then, and then when it gets to be too much, it would be like, it would be like, ah, oh, that's my dog, Robin. <laughs> now, Jackie was telling hey, us. Robin, I, Robin, I just farted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Bad timing on my part, speaking of timing. Now, I was going to mention, because you mentioned the Stern Show, Jackie was telling us about uh, the laugh. And he yes. said that the laugh was you and Fred, not his laugh, um, uh, when, when there would be a tragedy. Oh, no. He, it was a little of both. I poured it on big. I never played anything small in my life. I always played everything big and over the top because – you know, you don't do any service to the universe by playing it small. You want to inspire other people. And that's what I was hoping that there'd be people that would hear all this shit and go, that's what I want to do. And um, I had over-exaggerated mm -hmm. laughs. There's two Jackies. There's the one that like, you know, since, since there's the lady, since she's walking into the store, she couldn't believe it. And then there was the one that I did, which was like, um, hey, did you hear about the guy that couldn't come? We had to go get him. <laughs> <laughs> but that laugh, but it was his, they used to take his laughs from different parts of the show. That's what he said. Say, yeah. Um, oh, Howard, I don't know if you heard the uh, Malaysian jetliner. There were 250 people. It went missing, and they're all gone. <laughs> yeah. And he says that he would get shit for that from you yeah, know, from but, listeners. But it, but it was a tape. Right. <laughs> it was a tape of Jackie. Fred was the, the villainous one. Well, he that. credited Fred with a lot of things. Uh, well, Fred used to play his laugh. Yeah. It, yeah. They didn't play my laugh for tragedies. Um, so how long you stayed there? How long you were right up until you were there quite a while, right? You weren't an everyday there. person though, were you? No, I, I started out, um, because I was doing Ren and Stimpy and I was flying back and forth, uh, between, um, Los Angeles and New York. And I would come into the show maybe three <laughs> days a week and, you know, just get, I get up early quarter four and, get on the train, read three newspapers and just be ready for anything that anybody threw at me. And, uh, it, it was good. I mean, I, I can't say that I hated it. Although I was depressed, the worst depression you ever could imagine. Um, I had it, but once I entered the arena, once you go under the proscenium, it all disappears because the depression, the, was for, the depression was from what though? Was it, Oh, from birth, uh, he was. Chronic. Oh, okay. I thought, no, I thought it was because you were because of the show. Oh no, chronic low level depression. I was. Oh yeah, okay. Battling it, it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And I just, I said, the only place where I don't feel it gnawing at me is when I go in here and we're all laughing. And you know, it was like when everybody's laughing in a room, it's like someone shut off the gravity. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? All your wrinkles oh, go know. away and, and all your fat stomach just feels fine and your legs feel good. I feel absolutely beautiful on stage. It's the only place I feel comfortable and where I feel at home and I'm not depressed <clears throat> all the time. You know, I, I totally get what you're saying. <clears throat> you all right there? <laughs> <laughs> wow, is this ever going to be a great show? <laughs> Breaking so he was news. choked to death on Comedy Century. <laughs> I, I'm leaning into it. Are you all right? No. <laughs> no. You started making me laugh. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, when I'm laughing, I don't choke. Oh, okay. I mean, when I'm laughing at something I said, I don't choke. It's... You know, I, um, <clears throat> long time ago, oh, oh, excuse me. I better slow down. Long time ago, um, I opened up for George Carlin. 
I didn't do much comedy, but don't ask me how this happened. But I opened up for George Carlin at the Hampton Beach Casino. Wow. And <clears throat> he was brilliant, of course. And I saw him backstage and he got a he got a load of what I was doing. And um, he told me a joke. And I looked at him and I said, that yours? <laughs> he cracked up. <laughs> he cracked up laughing. You question every cheesy, every cheesy comedian like waits for somebody to say something really funny and then they go, that yours? <laughs> <laughs> so he died laughing at that. I, and and he said, Don't aren't you doing comedy? Do you do it much? I said, No, I'm a radio guy and I'm just, you know, just happen to be uh emceeing and he said you should you got the chops and i said wow thank you and, and he gave me his number but i never i never called I, I just i guess that i was meant to do what i'm doing and what oh, i want unquestionably have you ever thought about going and doing like an in concert kind of show like a theatrical show of your life doing these i think it'd make a great um i think it'd make a great musical actually <laughs> Billy during the musical during the uh, pandemic, we had a couple of years sitting around, and I and I, the, for a while there, you couldn't even go to the grocery store. Right. Yeah, because there were people, you know, carrying six tons of toilet paper, and uh, and pulling a Joe Pesci on each other over hand sanitizer, and you know that psychotic Sopranos anger over bread and milk, mm -hmm. and um, you know what do you need five loaves of bread for? Give me the fucking bread. <laughs> I don't know, but but I remember I couldn't do anything, and and I said I'm not going to sit here and do nothing because we did eventually record from home for commercials and cartoons. But right, I um I wrote a book. I just 22 chapters came flying out of me, and and it was about myself and about my life. And I said nobody nobody wants to hear about how great and wonderful your life is going. So I said, I'm going to tell the truth about how, you know, how it all arrived at this point it was that it was a horrific childhood, horrendous. And um, there were so many stories. And then I thought, I got to find an illustrator <clears throat> that can take some of these stories. And, you know, like there's, there's mm -hmm. this, um, there was a pork roast, not a pork roast, a pot roast, like roast beef on the kitchen table back in like the late fifties and it was our kitchen table. And we had this dog that was watching all day. He was watching my mom cook and he was watching everything. And he waited, he was, this dog was an operator. He waited for his move, you know? <laughs> and uh, when no one's looking, he goes up and like, <sighs> and he grabs the, the roast beef and he runs down the basement with it. And my father runs down after him and beats the crap out of him and takes the roast beef back, washes it off, and we had it for dinner. Oh my God. I, it's, said, it's... I said, I want to get an illustrator that could do that like a Norman Rockwell, you know? Yeah. Oh God, that would be fabulous. It's like it's like the Christmas story, the Gene Shepherd movie, you know, where the dogs the dogs steal the turkey and they just uh they're this... running through that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it. It. Uh, I just remember the poor dog. He was just like thought that it was an offering for him. Yeah, of course. But he planned it out. That's what the funny part was. And he <laughs> loved to drink beer. The dog. My dad. Well, maybe that. Beer. Maybe that's the way you should do the show. Then is to have these animations be created on stage, and you do the narration. Of you know maybe from. Uh, you know, maybe your stage right or left, and and you know you're in a, you're in a, a spot, but you're doing all these characters. That might be the way to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I think it'd be great. I think it'd be a great show. I'd go see it. And yeah. I'll go anywhere. Yeah. yeah go anywhere. Well, got two I don't go. We're we're on to something here. Yeah. You ever, like I, uh, think of like going into like the, I'm saying when you're younger. Because uh, I just noticed that you were doing the dog uh, yeah. barking, and your lips didn't really move. Yes. So, uh, did you ever think of like going around with a little dummy? And, and thanks for reminding that? me. I wanted to ask him that too. Yeah, you should, <laughs> have you? you ever done I, no, <clears throat> but I can do. There's that little joke box that used to say, um, "So, uh, Mr. Joke Box, what do you got to say today?" Fuck you! I hate you. That's you. Is that you? 
You suck. Stop <laughs> it. I hate you. So I don't, I don't even move my lips. I just like, you know. <laughs> but your cheeks flow out like Dizzy Gillespie. Yes. And it's also um, good to do Stephen Hawking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you could, I, and when I was a kid, my mom took me to a restaurant and um, I heard this noise, this weird sound. And I'm looking around and there's a man in the corner and he's, you know, and um, I said, Mom, what is that thing? And she goes, she knew it. She said it's an artificial larynx because this Bell Telephone used to make an artificial larynx for people right. that had cancer and had their voice box removed. And I said, I got to get one. <laughs> and uh, so, so many years later, um, many, many years later, I was in Vegas with some friends of mine and I went by a pawn shop and, and I see a you know, gold coin and a pistol and a guitar and a prosthetic leg and a prosthetic leg. You know, someone actually pawned their leg so they could go gamble and, and come God. back and, you know, go to the buffet with the five bucks. <laughs> you know, and, and then I saw this thing and I knew immediately what it was. I said, oh, my God, there's the there's the gadget, the thing. And I go in the store and I go, how much, how much? Guy was like, ah, I don't know, five like, bucks. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, five bucks. So I said, okay, thanks. And I go back to the hotel, and I was in front of the mirror, and I was like, ah, uh, hello, 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 hello. And the thing is, it doesn't work if you have a if you have vocal right. cords. So I said, fuck it, I learned to do it anyway. And it's like I was doing Stephen Hawking, like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Stephen Hawking saying fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck my dick. Holy shit. Oh, God. That's so funny. <laughs> Evil Stephen Hawking. I love no. it. No. No. It would be, it would be sit down comedy with Stephen Hawking. <laughs> An evil Doug. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, God. Just, um, you know, um, he probably. He could do a routine, you know. I can't. I don't want to go through the whole toiletry of spending that much time doing it. But he could talk about he learned how to. He learned comedy from the Three Stooges, how they throw pie in each other's face. Except he couldn't understand why somebody would throw pie in someone else's face, which would be three point one four five. <laughs> six. Oh shit! Oh my god! That's so funny. Good night. You guys have been great. <laughs> you know, See, it's you absolutely guys ridiculous. So I'm standing there with a spatula full of shit. Hey, good night, everybody. Good night. You guys have been great. That's my, that's my time. This this has been like a, a trip. I'm five years old and I'm walking through the toy department of Sears. And it's like, people are going, whatever you want, just take whatever you want. And, and all these voices coming out. Oh, <laughs> God, Billy, this, I, I've been, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. I don't laugh a lot. It's hard to make me laugh. Uh, well, you put you know, me away. People that are funny, it's like, there's, there's, there's got to be something that's super special to make you sit up and, and, and go and give it up. Because I, I'm, I'm kind of a tough laugh, but show me the most ridiculous, stupid, lowbrow thing, yeah. and it just hits me the right way, and I'll lose it. I'll lose Why it. Why are we, I think we as comics, and you, I consider you a comic. We are like oh, that. We do like the lowbrow you. shit. No, but we do. I mean, I, 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 I see somebody. I remember once my father I was, I was, he had me for the weekend, and he was carrying a load of linoleum. He's and he, and he slipped it. It still makes me laugh. He slipped in the snow, and he and he literally like in a cartoon went boom. All that was missing was the slide whistle, and he hit the ground. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and it makes me laugh to this day. So yeah, we do. It's, we do. Uh, those things do make people laugh, and it's a guilty laugh. Um, I'm trying to think. There's like real stuff makes me laugh, like with the Republicans. Mm -hmm. You can't. You couldn't even write the things that they just come out with daily. You couldn't no. write it as a bit 
because it it would be it would be so dissolute and so weird. Like, and all I can say is when I see Marjorie Taylor Greene, I don't want to discuss her politics. I don't want to say how stupid she is. I just look at her and I go, "That's the hottest orangutan at the zoo." <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> wow. You know, I mean, that to oh me, saying that is, is just as stupid or more stupid than what they could ever say. Holy shit, that's funny. Fighting she fire does, with fire. She does look like it. Yeah, you're right. She I wish I could show you. I found a picture. I found a picture of her <laughs> online. <clears throat> and then I found a picture of early woman, not early man, but early woman, like yeah. um, uh, something hominid. Uh -huh. um, you know, there was a Latin designation for early woman. And I put the two pictures together and it looked like it looked like Marjorie Taylor Greene <laughs> with like bushy hair. You know, Lucy, the, the early woman or something. Right. She's a horror story. She's as a, as a trans person. I mean, she just she just disgust me you know to the core i just that anyway i i i love that <clears throat> something about the southern accent that when they're talking like i i did a uh, convention in texas and some old biddies picked me up to take me to the show to the hotel and they were nice old biddies you know they were like you know and we just love you and my kids love you and oh yeah everything's so great and um, we get to the hotel and they were checking me in and I look at the, the TV in the lounge and it was replaying some of the 9-11 footage mm -hmm. because it was the anniversary of 9-11. And I was sitting there looking at it and thinking how horrible it was. And one of the ladies comes up beside me and she goes, those goddamn Iraqis. And I go, Cindy, Cindy, you know, Cindy, that the, the there was no Iraqis involved. That was the Saudis. And she said, tell that to the 5,000 people that died. Yeah. They don't care yeah. about the truth. The truth and doesn't matter. Oh, no. Nothing matters. It's, no. it, that's Marjorie Taylor Greene, though. I'm not yeah. saying everybody down south is like that. I no, but she is. Of, no, but she's just says the dumbest. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't uh, know. You know what I think? It's like you got to get really Zen about stuff or it'll drive you mental. Yes. Like, like AI art. Uh, if I was an artist, I would have a gun in my mouth because oh, I saw some of this. I art agree with you there. And I went, Oh my God, thank God I didn't stick with art because I was an artist, but, but it's using that, those uh, artists. It's using those artists talent to create new art. Yeah. And, and they're scraping the throats of famous voice people and putting that into an app so that some schmo can, not only can he be Da Vinci, he can be Mel Blanc. And I said, this is, this is, I can't get my mind around it. And I'm in an argument with somebody about AI. I said, they were scared of photography too. You know, um, oh, you know, at the beginning, we were very afraid of it. And I said, ah, shut up. And, and then I thought about it and I got all Zen. And I said, look, have your AI, go be Degas, go be Da Vinci, go be Monet, go, be Billy West, go be Mel Blanc with the, the AI, go make movies and TV. Anything that keeps you people from shooting each other, <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. down for. You know, honestly, I don't care what, go play, go do whatever you want. I've gotten to this point where I, you know, you and I are the same age, so I, I uh, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm like, I, what am I going to get upset about? I'll be dead by the time any of this matters. Any, you know, I'm just going to do right. what I do, you know, make people laugh the way I know how to make people laugh. And when I'm out of here, you know, sayonara. If you, you know, do you know and, what? I I have faith, and it's something that that I kind of thought about because I do these comic cons, <clears throat> and and I meet thousands of kids and their parents. Mm -hmm. And they all know what I do and they come out to see me and, and they're so beautiful. Um, I didn't know it. I was on the autism spectrum when I was growing up. I mean, I couldn't tie my shoes. I couldn't tie a necktie. I struggle still to this day trying to make a seatbelt work. But ask me to do a fucking Fran Drescher impression. That's autism. <laughs> and now we want to hear that Fran Drescher. Yeah, that we, we have to hear that. <laughs> 
<laughs> is, is there anything you have that you would like to do that you haven't done yet in entertainment? Oh no, I love I love what I'm doing. I'm very happy. I don't covet anybody's place in life or station in life or anything. I uh, I consider myself very lucky. I'm a journeyman, you know. I'll just keep coming to work till they tell me don't come in no more. Um, but but I was going to tell you something to to have as a hope for the future. Um, being on the autism spectrum, and I meet thousands of people that are on the autism spectrum. People at these comic cons there's no malice there's no mm -hmm. anger there's no tension they, these people are pure and they're mm -hmm. empaths the the uh, autistic people are, are they're em empathetic and um and they're sensitive and yes they process things sometimes upside down backwards but once you get through some of those things some of the most gifted people i've seen artists these, these this little girl came up in front of me and she drew something that blew my mind <clears throat> and she did it from memory it was a, a a picture of one of the cartoon characters with a background on it and everything and i just said this is so incredible that it's like they have superpowers you know and they're going to discover them but the point i'm i'm going to get to is we're in big trouble as a society like you know talking about the anger thing earlier where people have this sopranos type anger and Joe Pesci type anger over, you know, a guy just unbuckles at 35,000 feet and decides to act out on a plane, mm -hmm. you know, because he, he can't have another drink. And, and I said, people were not like this. This is like, it's, it's anti-humanity. It's, and, and we're attacking and shooting each other with this craziness. And I said, there's this accelerated rate of autistic births that I found out and yeah. I said, I think I know what's going on. Nature, like we might look the other way when we read, you know, it's like when we're, you ever thought you'd live to see the day when you're talking about a massacre and you have to go, wait a minute, which one are you talking about? You know, <clears throat> something really wrong. And we look the other way. We go, well, that's the new normal. And and I'm I, I, will, I refuse to believe that. I will not accept Well, that. yes, that's of me. course, because you're an old soul and you remember how people used to be. There was some humanity. Something went wrong. And and I think that autism is nature intervening, making a correction in 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 the species. Because if survival of the species is the main issue with nature, we're not long for this world, you know. So and we don't think, deserve to be either. No, so I think that um, it's nature making a correction. I think it's it's the beginning of an evolution I hope you're that right. we're not aware of. I think it's evolution. <clears throat> I hope you're right. I hope you're right. I hope so too, because I'm you know I'm sitting here and there's going to be physicists and genealogists and this one and that one. Yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, you don't know a Punnett Square from uh, Roslindale Square, <laughs> Madison yeah. Square. I f you know what genetics? Can, I I fail Punnett Squares too. So. It was what what are you doing? What's on the on aside from the reboots of uh, Futurama and Ren and Steppy? What else is going on with you? Um, I'm I'm finishing up this this book that I started and uh, oh, you are great. And I've been doing um, recording Ren and Stimpy and recording Futurama, and I also have been recording Disenchantment, which is Mac Renning's other show. <laughs> and it's, on, it's on Netflix, and uh, it's it's really charming, and and there's a lot of drama, but for a cartoon, you know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, is Mike it's is Mike Rowe involved with the Futurama? Um, he was. He was I remember writing. that. Yeah, I remember. I remember Mike was writing them, and uh, he and I were friends. We're friends. Yeah, uh, I I was so proud to see what he turned out to be. We started out around the same time at the Improv, and he he was a big Dick Van Dyke fan, as was I, and so we always used to talk about the Van Dyke show as being, you know, the the ac the the acme of. Uh, a television comedy, you know. Oh God, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, um, we used to talk a lot about that stuff, and I would say, do you remember the quips? You know, like uh, um, Richard Deacon would come in and go, "Where's the comedy spot, Rob?" And Maury answered him and go, "It's up here, Baldy." Hey, <laughs> <laughs> we had we had Bill Persky on in our one of our first episodes. Oh my God. Oh my God, Bill! If you get a like, chance, take a take a look at him. They were so he was so good, and he told so many great stories. It's 
it's the high point of my life talking oh, to him. He was so a good. he was a hero growing up. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I've been lucky. I've met a lot of my heroes. I met Mel Blanc. I I'm a guitar player, so I met Jeff Beck, and I was my knees were knocking because I don't I, I I don't go for celebrity stuff. I, I'm not celebrities aren't my fucking heroes. You know, artists right. are my heroes. Right. And um, and I met Sid Caesar. And oh, and, tell me about that. Tell me about that. Um, me and Mark Hamill and a couple other guys did a mockumentary about Comic Con, and we called it Comic Book the Movie, and we they managed to get a hold of Sid Caesar because they were producing some of his old shows, putting them out on Laserdisc. So he was he was amenable to, to coming and playing with us. There was no script. We made up the whole movie, really. And uh, we went to Comic-Con and filmed it. And um, I sat and had dinner with uh, Sid Caesar. And I and hate I, you. Oh, man. That's I wonderful. said, Sid, <clears throat> I was a little boy. I sat in front of that glass, wood, metal box, and I wanted to just reach out to you because you were the first televised image I ever saw, and it it destroyed me molecularly. And thank God my mom let me stay up and watch it. And he was he kind of had a twinkle in his eye, and I said, "And and now I can hug you, you know, and thank you for the laughter. I know what you went through and everything." And then one of the other guys is embarrassing me he's going billy do that do that thing you were doing the other day like and i said oh sh i'm not gonna perform in front of sid caesar and then i got roped into it and i was i i did this like italian guy who was going hunting a bubble of tutela tinte chachi medulla bella baguza gonna go got your big boobs did he join in with you because that's trying to be a lot of a dolce in high heels you know uh, that was the thing about double talk mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could gibber away and try to but make you had to have Italian that. or French, yeah. and then you throw in some English words, and that was the bit. Um, he had a twinkle in his eye. He, he had a big smile on his face, and he knew that I was the spawn of his loin. You know, he, he had to know. <laughs> I, I was wa every now and then when I'm when I'm down in the dumps, I will watch the "This Is Your Life" parody they did uh, with Howard Howard Morris as Uncle Goopy, and yep. and I just it and it. I know what's coming, and it, I, I'm dying laughing every time I watch it. I die it, laughing. I, yeah. I would, I would this call that. This is your um, life, Al Dunsey. Dun <laughs> and he, he just does that. Yeah, Dunsey. Yeah. But the name. Yeah. Dunphy, I think it was. But Dunphy. Well, they did. No, I forget, too. But but the thing is that they didn't wait for anybody. No. Do you know what I mean? Like. That clip, they didn't wait for anybody to get it. They just they nailed everything. Boom, 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 boom. And that they I think that I don't I don't think they rehearsed carrying him to the, you know, where he was fighting in the aisle and he was trying to escape. And then they Oh, and he they, had his jacket off and he was like, <laughs> Right, get out of here. And then they carried him, eventually carried him to the stage. Uh just Every, everything that I think I was inspired to do came from that stuff. Yeah. Um we're very you know, lucky. Grown up in that era, or, or very lucky. I think uh, I think we grew up in the best time that you could be alive. When I think about it, in the country, anyway. Well, if you were white, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but none of that matters if we're as violent as the Middle Ages. Suddenly, no, that's true. Well, I know, I, but anyway, I. Uh, God, this has been so much fun. I, I oh, thank I, you. I'm having a lot of fun too. Oh, I hope that you. I mean, we can have you back at some point. You think? I threatened to come there and and drag you out and take you to dinner or something. Oh, I would love that. I would love that. Will you what do you think of that? Well, I would love to go to dinner with you. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Oh, shit. You so, so much. Yeah. yeah when, when, you, when you do come to New York, let me know. We'll hook up and go, go to dinner or something. That'd be Absolutely. Great. All right. You got my number, right? You have my number. I gave it to you, right? Yeah, you got mine? I do. Yes, I do. Burn it. I'm going to sell it. <laughs> Burn it. <laughs> you never heard from me. You never heard my name. <laughs> right, well, phone number is what? 1-800-JOKELAND, right? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> you said your number is 1-800-JOKELAND. We'll call and you'll see if it is or not. 
Well, if I don't see you before Christmas, have a happy holiday. I don't Absolutely. know if you yeah, see, same to you. And, uh, same to you both. This, um, what a joy. This was just a joy. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for you. having thank me on. All right. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.